talknorth.com is powered by Bite Squad. Go to bitesquad.com or download their app. Get food to your door in minutes. Use the promo code TALKNORTH to get your first delivery free. Talk North gets you your first delivery free. So on Twitter the other day, and I usually don't use Twitter as a journalistic tool, or a, but the other day I thought, okay, here I am. I'm going to write about Josh Okogie. He kind of reminds me of all these great cult figures I've covered throughout my time in sports where, you know, they're not the best player. They're not, they're not even a starter, but just they cheer everybody up when they, when they play or when they're on the clubhouse. And, of course, you know, with my history and the nature of baseball, a lot of baseball names came up. So we're going to talk to Roy Smalley about some of who's who his favorite cult figures you know throughout baseball history have been this is Roy Smalley's chin music part of the talknorth.com podcast network this is our baseball show and uh, please uh, please download before you listen if you'd like to advertise with us you can reach me at talknorthpodcast at gmail.com thanks to our producer Brandon Morton uh, and thanks to our sponsors berrycoffee.com by the way I ran out to Kowalski's and bought some berry coffee the other day I'll tell you more about that later and Tony Hogan your state farm agent in Champlin so I did think of some baseball figures, Roy. I thought Lou Ford was a great uh, cult figure. I thought you mentioned Bombo Rivera. Mike Redman was great. Uh, but it's kind of a narrow a narrow path to walk to be a great cult figure. You have to be good enough to play, good enough that people want to see you in the game, but not so good that you become like someone who's commanding a lot of money or a lot of expectations. So who, who else other than Bombo is on your list? And if you want to tell me any Bombo stories, we'll take them. <laughs> Well, as I mentioned on Twitter, there are no Bombo stories per se. There's just Bombo being Bombo. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's uh, uh, it, and you're right. I mean, the cult figure it, it needs to be by definition. Uh, I mean, we, there has to be a, uh, a definition. There has to be criteria for uh, it to be a uh, for someone to be a cult figure. And and for me, it was always uh, that the the player became extremely popular for reasons mostly uh, other than uh, ability to play the game. And, yeah. and so, uh, and so it was antics on the field. It was stories about, you know, off the field uh, and just generally, and that's why, I mean, Bombo uh, just because of his name, I mean, Bombo Rivera, you can't get any, a better, a, a better name than that. And, um, he was an okay player, uh, but, uh, became a cult figure because of his name and because of the teams that we had, which were not pennant winners. And he actually was a uh, viable write-in candidate for president of the student body at the university of Minnesota. I mean, it doesn't get any more cult. I didn't than know that. that. In, in Say that body. again. Oh, Say God. that again oh, slower oh. for us slow people in the audience. <laughs> He he actually garnered a lot of votes for a student body president at the University of Minnesota. Oh, that's fantastic! People, students wrote in Bombo Rivera. I mean, he was there was a time when he was leading. I think I mean, in the vote tally. So I mean, it, I mean that's that's you don't get any more cult than that, in my opinion. And I thought I thought Lou Ford was a great call too, uh, and because of the definition of antics on the field. And then stories about him. There are countless wonderful stories about about Lou Ford, and and uh, I thought those were my two. Uh, you know, Bombo was mine. Lou Ford was yours. I thought those two were pretty pretty special. And also, basketball lends itself to these kind of figures because you have the person at the end of the bench, like Jose Crittenden, who you know just isn't going to play when a game is in doubt, and yet because he's that guy, and he's wearing a uniform, he's at the end of the bench. He's the guy you can celebrate with when he gets off the bench to finally get in a game when your team's up by 32 with 18 seconds left. You know, there's basketball. Yeah, he's great kind of the. Yeah, he's he was, was kind of the uh, human red Auerbach cigar. Yeah, uh, you know, so right. that was uh, so. Yeah, it's those those kinds of uh, those kinds of uh, players that uh, that generate this huge popularity uh, ab- about themselves. Uh, for uh, reasons that for two or three or four or five reasons that come before the sixth reason, which is how they play. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, preview, uh, we're going to give Roy the week off next week. And I had a long conversation, very long conversation with Derek Falvey, 
the uh, basically the baseball CEO of the Minnesota Twins. Uh, you know, he didn't break any news, but he was just very thoughtful talking about a lot of things, Rocco Baldelli, uh, you know, some of my favorite people in the game, how he's trying to do things. Uh, I think you'll, I think you'll find it to be an entertaining conversation. That's going to be next week's Roy Smalley chin music. Uh, check out talkdork.com, subscribe to iTunes or whatever else, check that out. So we'll, we'll kind of go big picture with Roy here since we won't be talking to him for a couple of weeks. Uh, I was going to say that basketball, the end of the bench guy really qualifies, you know, long snapper like Mike Morris, that's that's the kind of the right role. But one of, one of the things you and I always talk about, baseball is great for that because you do have people come from absolutely nowhere and they matter for a while and they might go away forever, but you'll always remember them. Lou Ford played at Dallas Baptist when I think it was undrafted at a time when they're like 85 rounds in the baseball draft. And he ends up kind of rising through and all of a sudden he takes over for Torrey Hunter in 2004 and he plays well. Oh, he played great. And I mean, he got, he got some huge hits. He ran around the bases and generated a lot of excitement. Uh, he was, he was a little bit, the kind of, I mean, a little Jimmy Pearsall ish, you know, I mean, you kind of half expected him to run the bases the wrong way at, you know, yeah. at some point in time, but I mean, he was, you just never knew what, uh, what Lou might, uh, might do. And there's all those, those great stories about him. Uh, you know, iron trying to iron his shirt while he was wearing it, and and uh, you know, I mean, it, me. it, those kinds of, you know, those kinds of things that just I, I, he's uh, he's a, he's a cult a cult figure for me for sure. Uh, is there anybody else you can think of? You know, I, I thought I thought about including Eddie Guardado as kind of a back when in the days when he was just kind of a specialist, but he he just he got too big and he was good at, no, at his roles all the way through. I didn't player, think he quite actually. Actually, I think uh, I, I, he was too good, and yeah. and I actually think that uh, you know, although Mike Redman, I see he was such a popular guy with, especially his teammates, you know, I, I just don't think he was uh, he he was understood to be that way among the fans enough to generate a cult status. I mean, I I love the guy; he's a great guy to have on a club, uh, but uh, I don't think people uh, I don't think people knew enough. If enough people had seen his uh, his walk, uh, his naked walk, then uh, he most certainly would have been a cult. It would have become a cult figure. Well, if, if a lot of people had seen his naked walk, he'd be in jail, and we'd be talking about him for other reasons. <laughs> well, but you know, there you go. That that could be one of the one of the criteria for uh, for being a cult figure. Absolutely. Let's. Uh, I know you had a story you want to tell, uh, a mound story. Which again, this is why well, I love I baseball. Just, well, actually, you know, I was going to say, Roy, hold on one second. Let's let's go ahead and thank Barry Coffee real quick, and then go into your story. I do want to thank Barry Coffee, BarryCoffee dot com, sponsor of this program for a long time. And Roy's told you about you know their their customer service. Uh, oh my God! You know what? I'm sitting here doing the show, and I hear this voice. I'm like, who walked in on me? You know what it is, guys. It's Alexa is trying to join the show. <laughs> Alexa get is rid of it. I'm telling us. you, I'm just telling you, get rid of, do not, do not have Alexa. Do, just get rid of it. I, I'm just telling you. Well, it, I'm just, I'm, I'm just warning. I, this is consider this a warning. Well, here's where I am, Roy. I think Facebook is evil and nobody should be on Facebook. But as long as I'm producing a podcast, I kind of need that outlet. So I feel guilty and hip <laughs> hypocritical, but I kind of need it. I've even asked our sales guy, I said, can I get off Facebook? Can I just destroy Facebook? Uh, no, we kind of need it. So I'm completely hypocritical. I think Facebook is terrible and everybody should get off of it. And yet I'm not getting off of it yet. And I, and I feel the same way with these, putting these stupid, isn't it funny how Americans used to walk around worried that boy, you know, Russia or somebody might be spying on us. And now we bring this, we pay for the spies and we put them right in the middle of our, our kitchens right and our living rooms. Our, yes. Say, please yeah, well, spy on us. Please collect so, all my data and my preferences and send it to mother Russia. <laughs> it's exactly right. And my, uh, uh, my uh, business partner in, uh, in our investment business at, uh, in Morgan Stanley, uh, has uh, uh, two young kids, and he uh, he has also has an Alexa, and he had he never uses Alexa. It's been sitting in his uh, in his place for you know a month or two without any uh, interaction at all. And one day he came out of his bedroom into the kitchen, and the kids have made a giant mess. And and he and Ryan, my my business partner, said, 
what in the holy hell is going on around here? And all of a sudden, Alexa pops up and says, it's okay, Ryan. Things will work out. Oh, my God. I mean, we're in. Can you believe it? I mean, I, that would have gone. That would have been jettisoned off the 51st floor. If I, if that, that would have freaked me out. I'm just warning you. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just, but I'm just warning you. I think you know what you're talking about. I, and for older <laughs> people like us, those who saw Hal in, in Space Odyssey 2001, <laughs> we know what they're going to do. They're going to try to lock us all out and steal our, I mean, we're, we're dead. We're dead at this yeah. point. It, and it, I, I said the thing about, you know, inviting the spy into our house. It also reminds me of a comedian's joke about modern times where we used to warn our kids Please don't ever get into a car with a stranger. And now we have an app so you can call up a stranger and have them come over and pick you up. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly uh, right. And, you know, I'll have to rethink that. I use that all the time, too. I'll have to rethink that maybe a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let, let me tell so you about talk, more. Let's talk about the old days. Well, I got to talk about Barry Coffee first. I want to, you know, okay. Roy always tells you about Steve Brem's company, the cu- great customer service, how there are more and more restaurants in more and more businesses in the Twin Cities area and why you should use them, why every restaurant and every bar should use them. Uh, but I just wanted to add another thing. I got a coffee, a member of the family who's a coffee snob is coming to town. So I was like, I need to get some good berry coffee. We love the Bull Run Roast. Roy and I have told you about that. We've been out to the roasting plant, had it fresh. It's the, the best coffee I've ever had. And I'm like, okay, I need to get a pan. And and Steve was like, hey, you know, I think Steve was like, hey, we can hook up. I'll give you some. I'm like, no, I just want to go buy some. I'll, I'll keep things simple. We're all busy this time of year. I didn't want him to have to go out of his way. So they sell berry coffee and a bunch of different varieties that I didn't realize existed. Everything from French roast to, uh, you know, to breakfast blend, a house blend, whatever, at Kowalski's on Lindale, uh, kind of down in the, I guess that would be the uptown. It's right off 35. It's, it's not far from 35 on Lindale. You can Google it. Uh, and they have just this massive amount of berry coffee sitting there in the store. You just walk in and buy a pound ground, a pound of pure beans. So I got one ground, one beans. I'm going to give it as a Christmas present uh, to the coffee snob in my life. So I recommend you do that too. Obviously, you can always uh, go to berrycoffee.com and order something. You can call them at 952-937-8697. But if you ever just want to go get a pound and keep it really simple, go to the Kowalski's uh, on Glendale, right off 35. It's And you're in and out in five minutes and you have berry coffee in your home. I recommend that. All right, Roy, tell me your story. Well, the way, the way this came about was uh, someone on uh, Twitter uh, who uh, follows me sent out a really – a really cute clip of uh, the, um, uh, I, I believe it was, uh, yeah, it was Bull Durham, uh, a meeting on the mound where they end up talking about all kinds of, uh, all kinds of stuff. The infielders come in and they're, they're talking about stuff. And the, and, uh, the Twitter uh, follower uh, said, I miss, I miss baseball. I want March, you know, March to come, which at this point in time, I, I think we, we kind of all do it. And someone said, uh, because about that clip, you know, there, there must be some great conversations on the mound. And I would tell you after, you know, 13 years in the big leagues and, and a year and a half in the minor leagues, uh, I've heard some fantastic ones and you, you'd be amazed at the, at the stuff that's talked about on the mound. I don't think that kind of stuff happens so much anymore. I used to, I used to go in, you know, with young pitchers and, and, uh, try to calm them down, try to say something stupid or, you know, get them thinking about something else. And, and I uh, have a conversation with him totally uh, about uh, something other than baseball. But the, but <clears throat> the best one I ever heard, I have to set up by giving you a picture of Art Fowler. Art Fowler was a pitching coach for Billy Martin. When I first came up to the big leagues with the Texas Rangers in 1975, <clears throat> excuse me, Google Art Fowler. He, w- he was in baseball forever. And he pitched in uh, the old Pacific Coast League for, for a long time. Went back when that was kind of like almost like the big leagues. And now, I mean, they were great talent back then. Did pitch in the big leagues quite a bit. Uh, just spent his whole life in baseball. But he was a kind of a Tweedledum, Tweedledee looking guy, uh, bow legged, uh, his toes turned out. Uh, roomy eyes. He was just a, uh, just a, a real drinker and, and red in the face uh, because of that alcohol consumption. 
And that's why he was there because he was Billy's drinking buddy. And down in Texas, you know, Billy would, you know, is legendary. I mean, he 